time to that service. And what, what's cool about that process is when you do this authentication, it's actually verifying that you are who you say you are, and it's verifying that the server says, I'm the server, we can verify that on our phone because it's mutual authentication for cryptography. Um, what, what, that, what, what that's important for is if you think of man in the middle attacks, if you're on my network with me, I'm at a Starbucks and I'm logging in, if we didn't have that level of scrutiny at a cryptographic level, you could actually spoof the server I'm logging into, steal the key I'm trying to log in with, and just pass it on to the person after me. Um, kind of complex, kind of, again, very cryptographic related and ugly stuff. Uh, the important part is to know that you're being protected at a layer that um, some services don't offer. So like I said, Twitter offers this now. Twitter's mobile app does a form of this in their actual authentication. So if you do use Twitter's two-factor now, uh, and you have the in-app stuff, that's what it's basically doing. Cool part about this, you have data service. If you have data, you can be on Wi-Fi, you can be on cell, you don't have to have SMS capabilities, you don't have to have calling features, all you have to have is data, right? So that's a little bit less of a hurdle, because uh, like, if I'm in Amsterdam or I'm in France, I'm still hopping on people's Wi-Fi left and right and using their Wi-Fi, uh, much easier proposition than trying to get a SIM for $80 for like the week I'm there, right? Uh, Geolocation is an interesting one. Uh, there's a company called Twofer, and they actually do kind of a, a focus on geolocation as their authentication. So if you're at your home and you're at your office and those are the two places you log in the most, there's a, there's a safe assumption to say that if your phone says I am at this location, Twofer's service will say, oh, you're at that location, I don't need you to do, do two-factor. Your geolocation data from your mobile phone, because there's an app on your phone, is saying that you're there, that's the second factor then. You're, you're, you, you at that point, right? It's not a retina scan, it's not a fingerprint scan. It's kind of a mixture between where you are, where your phone is, and the fact you have a phone with that mobile app. Um, while, their, uh, while their implementation has, I think, some safeguards against this, there's a, there's a bit of a problem. Uh, some of you guys might be familiar with what's known as the confused deputy attack. So let's say I'm at my home and it's 4 a.m., okay? I might be sleeping. Uh, an attacker in China might be starting their work day. <laughs> That person has my username and password because they stole it, whether a phishing attack or a brute force against a password dump or some other bad thing, right? I'm in my home with my phone, right? So my second factor is technically covered because that was one of my safe areas, but they have my username and password in China. Now, that becomes a bit of an oops situation because they can actually log in as me because my phone's in the right place and they're logging in. So, yep. But if it's doing Geo IP too, it's going to know that they're trying to log in from China while your phone's in your phone. Well, and that's why proxies are a fun thing, right? Uh, they, they can easily be in Detroit, Michigan without much effort if they want to. Um, and that's the thing. These services don't, don't usually pin off a single IP. They usually pin off a geolocation from your phone. So if you're in the right section of the map in terms of geo-coordinates, it'll say yes. And that's where the problem comes in. Um, so there's... Trust me, geolocation is a cool idea, and it, and it certainly has its practicality. Um, but again, there are attacks, uh, just like any other security system, there are always things you have to be considered well, it seems like that really provides almost zero security. If you're always I would one, agree to that. Always <laughs> <one> <laughs> but they're also places, competitors of ours. But, yeah, um, if you're in one, always in one of two places, yeah. the fact that you're there isn't authenticating the login. Yeah. So we have this phrase called security theater. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yep. yeah, but also, it, it opens up uh, another problem for you, the user. System. And now you're telling this third party company over here you know, where you are all the time. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 mean, uh, I mean, most of these services you probably have your IP and you are, you shouldn't care geo resolve, but yeah. Sure, but you have to tell more people. Um, so, other than mobile apps, uh, biometric, obviously, um, I, you know, I think. Touch ID is the, the best implementation, or, or maybe, maybe not implementation, but the best example of pervasiveness of biometric. A lot of you guys have probably had a you know USB or a built-in fingerprint scanner for a lot of years on uh, you know like a Lenovo or a, a Dell, um, but it wasn't really prevalent. Maybe your office used it, but like the day-to-day -day user didn't. Uh, I would probably guarantee that more people have uh, iOS uh, or iPhone 5s with Touch ID than you probably ever seen with a, a fingerprint scanner in your, your entire life. Um, smart cards, these are still popular. The implementation of smart cards change quite often. Um, 
not, you know, common access card if you, you know, you're in the government space, very common still, not, not, not a surprise to see. Um, but for the everyday end user, you know, having a smart card versus a hardware token is not much better. Um, most of us have a, how many people have a smartphone? Right, okay. So um, if you can have a device that has a cryptographic store and it can do cryptography and it has a clock source and it has capabilities for mobile apps and capabilities for cell and data and Wi-Fi networks, this is an awesome authentication device and it's always on you, right? So this is kind of, you know, again, why we're going the way we're going. Um, certainly all these things are valid methods and all these are used by someone somewhere. Um, but having a mobile application on a phone with some sort of public private key cryptography is kind of the, the par for the course now. Uh, what, what I want you to take out of this chart of just X's and, and craziness is if you have a token, for instance, uh, and these are all basically positive attributes if you want to think of them that way. Uh, if you have a token, for instance, tokens don't require an internet connection. That's a, that's a positive. Um, it doesn't work based on geolocation, though. That's a negative. It doesn't work with a cell phone. That's a negative. It doesn't work with a landline. That, so basically, more X's means better is, is kind of the long and short of this, the TLDR. Um, now, mobile applications can certainly also have top P, because like a mobile application like our, our dual mobile thingy does our mobile app as well as top P or hot P open standards. Google Authenticator mobile app does top P and hot P. Um, the, the cool thing to think about is if you have mobile apps and you have top P and you have call and you have SMS, one cell phone does all four of those columns effectively, right? So cell phones, in terms of an authentication credential, aside from the fact that we all carry them all the time, and they're powerful, and they can do crypto, and all this other stuff, all of those columns basically are supported by the fact that, hey, your phone is a very powerful device, and why not use it for authentication? Um, so this is, where, this is where things get a little bit tougher to, to, to kind of go over based on your personal business or your professional worries or whatever else you might have. Um, Two-factor authentication, the reason why I don't think it did take off is you, to use like RSA Secure ID, you basically had to have a server, you had to initialize tokens, you had to buy tokens, you had to sync those tokens to the server, you had to then give those tokens out to people. If they lost one, you'd have to basically disable that account being valid, you'd have to um, buy them a new token, <coughs> reprovision a new token, very cumbersome process, and then of course you want high availability, right? You don't want to have one server, you want to have one server per location, so like if one data center falls over, you can still authenticate two-factor, right? Yep. And that one time, like the RSA keys were, the private keys were stolen, right? So all the tokens... Oh, you're, you're getting stolen. ahead of me now. That's my fun, like, spoiler moment for RSA. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, my, my opinion is, and it just so happens that that's also how we kind of view things as a company, uh, you guys, at any one single time, might want a hardware token. You also might want to have a cell phone somewhere. You also might want to have someone uh, a, a method to call a VoIP line. You also might want to have an SMS authentication method. Having one hardware token that you have to have every single day of your life is not perhaps the best way to do security, right? Because it's inconvenient, and inconvenience leads to turning off security, right? Uh, this isn't you know, uh, a scientific study I had to release to make this obvious. Uh, if security's hard, you've generally turned it off, right? Um, some of these forms of authentication, so primarily, um, I'm trying to think what, there was a breach of like a, uh, not breach, I guess, there was a Trojan in a World of Warcraft piece of software um, a couple months ago, I forgot what the name of it was, I, if anyone remembers, yell it out. But basically what happened is, this software, you, you like Google for the software, you download the software, it was Trojan, you type in your username, your password, and on your Blizzard keychain or your, your mobile app, you generate a one-time password. You type that into this app, and it would send your username, your password, and your one-time password to the attacker. And it would never send it to the server you were trying to actually authenticate to. Because of that, they could just then log in as you and steal all your stuff and you know do whatever they're going to do with it after that point. Uh, so like. Basically, this comes down to in-band authentication and out-of-band authentication. So if I'm logging into a server, and I have a username and a password, and I push that through my browser, right? If an attacker can somehow sniff that network traffic or sniff the browser itself and grab those details, they... 
does not like RSA parts. Ah, uh, that's what I'm getting out of this. The, the attacker can steal those values and then use those anytime they want to use those values and log in as you. Um, however, some methods, including like Twitter, including what we do, like basically it's inbound and, or inbound and out of band. So you log in with your username and password with your browser. The, the server you're logging into and the server for the service provider, like Twitter, actually communicates on the back end. And they then send a message from Twitter server to your phone. On your phone, then you say yes or no. An attacker can't do that because they, they, they never have access to that data. It's completely out of their path of control. Your computer might be compromised, but your phone hopefully isn't compromised at the same exact time. Otherwise, you've been highly targeted or just have really bad luck. <laughs> um, I think I think really you know whether it's biometric, whether it's um, push off or push notification type stuff. Uh, there's going to be plenty of new ways to do two-factor. I've seen a bunch of ways. I have an I have a list of two-factor competitors, of course, and it's like it's like 90 companies with 90 different ways of doing two-factor. That's all good. I think anytime you have a market space that's evolving and and people are get, getting creative and innovative, that's good. Um, my concern, like we were talking about earlier, we don't want security theater. We don't want people thinking they're safe, but actually just like not actually protecting them anymore. Um, so that's kind of always going to be the trick, right? So RSA, um, I'm going to put a couple of these up here just for funsies. Uh, I'm going to put one more. Okay. Um, so the, the, the basic gist of the first two bullet points are five years ago, you didn't really have a choice between an RSA server or anything else. Now you have an RSA server if you want to deploy one, or you have about, I don't know, 20 different two-factor providers that are cloud-based. You don't install a server, you don't have to manage things, you just have a cloud service just like you have a service for everything else you probably do, like Gmail or Basecamp or anything else. Uh, so there's a, lot, there's a lot less overhead to install two-factor, and one of the big downfalls for most companies, even, even big companies, was the cost buy-in for licensing, for hardware tokens, for servers, right? And that's why the cloud's awesome, right? We can buy this crap as we need it and get rid of it if we don't need it and not sign contracts and not have licensing agreements and not have service maintenance contracts. Uh, basically, all the reasons IBM survived this as long as, long as it has uh, was based on all the mainframe contracts they had for service for you know decades. Um, you don't have to have any of that in the cloud now. That's why AWS and all these other things are, are awesome. One thing to think about, though, is any single two-factor integration, except for one example, which I'll tell you about that's not on the slide, Almost every single two-factor integration you do will have to have some form of code modification, right? If you log into a service, you're going to have to short-circuit the authentication process to say, okay, username and password matches, now let's do two-factor, two-factor worked, now let's give a session. So whether that's two lines of code or 20 lines of code or 200 lines of code, probably depends on your application. Um, a lot of providers, though, do have SDKs. They do have really easy APIs, REST APIs to integrate with. And a lot of them also package up, like uh, drop in like SSH, drop in Outlook Web Access, drop in blah, blah, blah. So most of the stuff, again, you don't have to necessarily hack on unless maybe it's like your, your custom web app, for instance. Um, there are people that have done actually DNS-based two-factor, where basically you point all your DNS at them, like just like Cloudflare, if anyone has to use Cloudflare for like DDoS attacks and stuff. Um, and basically, by going through their DNS, they basically are validating you in some really hokey kind of ways, but yeah, five minutes. Okay, great. Um, Kevin, you're gonna hold me to time. Jeez, come on. I thought we were friends. Um, so when you when you sign up for things, uh, you know, LinkedIn again is SMS only. Thirty seven signals. Basecamp now is SMS only. Facebook. One thing that people don't notice is there's actually the code generation option, which is just again ten minutes apparently too. Great. Um, which is. Uh, Top P, which again is an open standard. You can download an app today on your mobile phone, use it for free, and have you know a, a soft code uh, generated, or have an S, uh, SMS. Um, we're going to jump through this since we have ten or five minutes uh, pretty quickly. Uh, cryptography is important, but you don't have to worry about that. If you are a crypto geek, those are the algorithms that are being used to do this stuff. Uh, with an RSA key pair, again, your phone holds the private key. If a company that does that kind of authentication gets compromised, all they're going to lose are your public keys, which, by the way, are still public. They're, they've always been not a, a big deal. Um, if you lose your phone, however, you probably should reprovision your app on your phone if you ever get your phone back, get rid of the old certificate, generate a new private key. 
Um, but this is different because with this style, despite the fact that that says RSA as an algorithm, because RSA basically has a seed value or a, um, or a uh, you know, secret value, depending on how you want to uh, call it, they got compromised in 2011 and they had to send out 40 million new tokens. That's the difference between symmetric key cryptography and asymmetric key cryptography is if a company doing RSA's algorithm, which has a public and a private key pair, or a public and private key in the pair, you can have your phone get lost generating a new token or a new, a new private key. If the company gets uh, owned, no data is lost. If you're using symmetric key cryptography, which is how their their ID, their secure ID technology worked, um, they basically had to generate all new secrets or all new seed values and send out all new tokens because there's no way to like reinitialize them with a different value. Oops, there we go. Um, so a couple details. I have no awards other than the stickers and business cards, which no one wants. But uh, <laughs> what are two oath standards that are popular for two FA? I'll, I'll praise you. Answer. Come on. Talk and talk Boom. Praise. Yes. <laughs> talk and talk uh, so remember, just remember, top P is is what people basically use. If you download a mobile app on on your app store, it's probably going to be doing top P. Uh, Facebook, Dropbox, Google, all use top P. What's another name for two factor? There's a lot of these. Two step verification. Yep. Or yeah, more similar ones. Multi factor. Multi factor. Yeah. Um, Multi factor, two factor, TFA, two FA, T dash FA, all all the same basic lexicon. Um, and you know, keep in mind that two factor is a type of strong authentication, just for the pedantic among us. Uh, is using a password plus a passcode sent to your phone to FA. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so it doesn't matter that it's a not a like physical thing that you have to like jam into a wall or your face or something. If you have to have a thing to get the thing to log in aside from your password, that is still two factor. How is that? How is the passcode different than a passcode? Because the passcode is being generated, and the thing that's generating that has the technology and the know-how and the secret key to actually do that part. Your brain can't generate. Maybe your brain can. I don't know. You're, you're a smart guy. If your brain can generate like SHA-1, HVAC SHA-1 hashes with a secret key, <laughs> then I guess you are two-factor enabled as well. <laughs> hey, Brian. Brian is a smart guy. I'm not, I'm, not um, I'm not even one factor. So, so a lot of hard, hardware tokens traditionally have been hot P if they are um, open standard. Again, RSA security is not an open standard, it's proprietary. Um, we are seeing that newer tokens are actually clock synced and actually have a time source proper. Um, so what are some of the ways a mobile application can be used with, uh, you know, two-factor context? Well, obviously the passcode sent to your phone. Well, and it could also be with uh, always on connection through the cell phone itself. It could be an RSA key file. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so, I mean, you can, you can basically have a soft token. So, like, if you have Google Authenticator on your phone right now and you hit the key or whatever it has now, um, that will generate a top P or a hot P code. You can also do the push authentication to the mobile app. Um, you can also do like geolocation stuff with like Twofer's app, for instance. So the app itself is like kind of a means to an end. Uh, the one thing I'd like to like leave you guys with as I put um, this slide I don't actually have up of my contact details, which is stupid. Um, great. Uh, that's why I this card. That's why the card is. Yeah, apparently. Uh, yeah, I don't know what happened. Um, one thing I want to leave you with in terms of uh, authentication mechanisms and, and all this stuff is people are going to keep getting breached. LastPass, we actually integrate, like our platform integrates with LastPass. If you're not using Password Manager yet, you really, really should be. Um, it saves a lot of time. It doesn't take a lot of overhead like LastPass or 1Password or KeyPass, all these things. A lot of them have browser plugins like 1Password. Um, you hold like band backslash and it like pops up all the autofill possibilities for that website you're at. Not hard. Remember though that a phishing attack, if they steal your password, it doesn't help that you use a password manager. If they steal a, a dump of passwords in, that are hashed or cryptographically like managed somehow, then yeah, it does matter because like a longer, more complex password helps. But if an attacker can actually get your password, 
that's where two-factor comes in and really means means the difference between ownage and not ownage. I'd say um, the big difference with the password manager though is they may have only compromised one account that way if you were generating separate passwords for everything you use. I, I, ideally, than, and which account, which account that is is the important part. If your yeah. Gmail account gets owned, perhaps they could probably reset yeah. all your passwords for all your other accounts yeah. though. So uh, when it rains, it pours, right? So um, if you haven't used two-factor before. Uh, uh, our, our app, Duo Mobile, downloads for free on all those platforms, Android, Windows Phone, blah, blah, blah. Google Authenticator, I think, is available for all those platforms. Um, they'll do hot P and top P out of the box, completely free, no charge, anything. Uh, all the services we talked about earlier and many, many more do it for free. So if nothing else you leave with today, please enable two-factor on the things you really find valuable in your life. Probably Gmail, maybe Dropbox, hopefully uh, Amazon Web Services if you're an AWS person, Stripe. Some of these accounts that really mean the difference between like having a really bad week and not. Social media, I don't know how important you are. I'm not important. My account could get compromised. I'd never know. Um, so hopefully you guys got a lot out of this. I know it's a lot to cover in, in an hour. Uh, if you have questions, there are cards. There are some stickers. If you want to be a fanboy, that'd be awesome too, or girl. Um, shoot me an email if you have questions. I'm more than happy to talk about two-factor and everything else computer security. So thank you for your time, guys. Have a great day. Sure, yeah. I'm always in the area, so that, that makes it easier for me for sure. Yeah. yeah. Go to, uh, I, I always miss going with you guys. Uh, yeah.